session starts with an amazing talk by Andrew Wall at Microsoft. And the talk title is The Role of Optics in Big Five Tech Companies, The Yellow Brick Road to a Career in Consumer Electronics. I know you don't want to listen to me anymore, so I will quickly let Andrew start his amazing talk. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for having me. This is a pretty unique experience. Um, I was a graduate here with my PhD in 2013, so it's really exciting to be back and talk about optics. Um, so I noticed I put the longest title on uh, the whole program, so I apologize for that. And before we get into it, I actually should get into a couple disclaimers specifically about the title itself. Um, so if you're looking for this exactly, it might be a bit of a mess, so I want to kind of clarify a couple things. Um, so first of all, Big Five technology. Um, I think this is a concept that, especially over the last 10 years, there are these five big companies that everybody's very excited about. They drive the industry. Um, more and more, though, you see a lot of startups in SVC. You see a lot of companies internationally coming in. So there's not really a big five anymore. There's really like a big 50 or 100. So there's all these companies that we're talking about. And so I myself work at Microsoft, but there's a lot of other companies that you can think about. And we'll talk about kind of the different roles they have. Um, you notice in my title, I talked about the yellow brick road. There will be nothing on the Wizard of Oz. So I hope nobody was too excited or dissuaded by that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Figured that would probably do it. Um, so in terms of an expert, I do work at Microsoft. Um, I can pretend to have all the answers, but to be honest, I've only been there for about five years now. So in terms of my expert level status, it actually doesn't exist. So I apologize again if uh, you want to know all the questions about the industry, but again, I'll do my best. Um, so lastly, there's this idea about consumer electronics. Um, we think of consumer electronics such as things as TVs, laptops, um, cell phones for sure, a lot of drones and things like that that are starting to make their way into the workplace. So we think of gadgets when we think of consumer electronics. But really the thing about consumer electronics that I want to stress as well, and I'll try to do so in the next 20 minutes or so, it's not just the things that we see right now. There's a lot of fun gadgets that are out there. There's a lot of fun technologies that these big companies are working on. And everything from the incubation to applied sciences all the way up through the product stages. So with that, I'd like to actually rename my talk a little bit, uh, and I'll retitle it as One Non-Expert's Ideas for a Path to an Optics Career in Fun, Fancy Things. <laughs> so hopefully this kind of sets the stage a bit better for uh, some of the things I'll be talking about. Um, so first, a little bit about myself um, in terms of my background. Um, I actually got involved in physics in high school. Um, like many of you, I took a lot of classes in biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, I really like to see how things work. Um, I was kind of interested in biology, but realized you don't really understand biology unless you know chemistry. I uh, liked chemistry, but realized you don't really understand chemistry unless you know physics. So why do biology without physics? So I really got into physics. So it was very exciting for me. I actually had a professor, um, or I guess a high school teacher, that had worked in the industry for about 40 years or so and come back to teach afterwards. He was very inspiring. So he had all these fun stories about stuff he would blow up at work and things like that. And I thought, yeah, I think I want to go do that. Let's go do science and industry and see what that looks like. Um, so from there, knew I wanted to do physics. Uh, went to a college in North Carolina, which is where I'm from. Saw a couple of the UNC Charlotte people last night, actually born in Charlotte. So great to see you guys out here. Um, so in college, I pursued physics. Um, actually went to a small liberal arts school in North Carolina, Wake Forest, uh, which some of you might have heard of, especially the Charlotte people, I hope. Um, and though it was liberal arts, took a lot of courses in sociology, psychology, English, things that to me, maybe not as interesting, might just be a me thing. Um, so started physics uh, very early there as well. Um, started getting involved in the coursework, everything from your, your basic mo motion dynamics to relativity up to E&M. Um, and had an opportunity to get involved uh, after my second year in a, uh, almost like an internship, but really just a research experience. So started in biophysics at that point. Um, was studying motor proteins and cellular dynamics and thought, well, this is kind of neat. Um, but again, Biophysics for me at the time wasn't really something I was super interested in. I was interested in the optical aspects of it. And so I looked for another lab. Um, came across another uh, previous industrial uh, experience professor that had gone back to Wake Forest uh, to start up a laser condensed matter lab and started working for him for, I guess, my last year and a half or so of undergrad. Um, so from this, uh, we essentially had these big laser setups. We would shoot lasers at zinc oxide and see what happens, basically. Um, you know, I was the undergraduate in the lab, so I had the joy of shooting lasers at things. Um, and as you all uh, are starting to experience with a lot of the great research I saw last night, um, this is really kind of where your interest starts to peak a little bit. So from there, you're an undergraduate. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought, well, why try to go get a job? Let's see what graduate school is all about. 
and more specifically, wanted to see what we could really do with physics at this point. So um, I know you're all starting to think about graduate school, think about what you want to do in life, and you're trying to understand what types of fields there are out there. So for me, I looked at a lot of applied physics programs. I looked at a lot of straight physics programs. Uh, but my professor also mentioned a place called Arizona. Um, and for me, it's across the country. It's in the middle of the desert. wasn't really sure I knew much about it. Um, but I had also started hearing back from some of these schools that I applied to, and there were some research efforts that were underway and things like this. But then I got this packet in the mail from Arizona and said, you should probably come out here and look. Um, so I came out uh, for a program very similar to what you guys are interested in or what you're here for this weekend. Um, had an opportunity to see a lot of the research going on. Came, saw, you know, it's 75 and clear when there's snowstorms in the rest of the country. Thought, we need to go see what's going on in Tucson. So optics for me was always a subset of physics. And that is to say that some of my professors had optical experience. Um, some talked about a course in optics, but I never really thought of it as its own discipline. That's why something like the College of Optical Sciences here is really so fascinating. Uh, I myself actually worked for Jennifer Barton, uh, who I think presented yesterday in biomedical imaging. So I worked on some of these multimodality, multimodality probes, actually building endoscopes for mice. Um, so small finesse, got a little bit messy at times, but very exciting. Um, the thing that's really interesting to me as I look back, um, I mentioned that I went to a liberal arts school undergrad and took all these courses that I was somewhat interested in and the physics that I was very interested in. The thing I noticed about here, College of Optical Sciences, are the courses that you take as soon as you step foot on campus, those are immediately applicable to anything you're going to do in industry. So I always tell the story, as soon as I joined Microsoft, the first couple weeks I'm starting to get my feet wet. I think within the first two weeks, I had already used everything from the eight to ten classes that I took while I was here. So it was a pretty unique and exciting experience. Um, the research that I did, uh, like I mentioned, was in biomedical imaging. Um, started to get a feel of what it was like to work in academia, but also wanted to see what it was like to start getting into industry. So for that purpose, after my fourth year, uh, I had my master's, was starting to get close to being done for my PhD. I uh, started to look around and see what types of industrial applications there were, specifically for biomedical imaging. So after my fourth year, I had the opportunity to do an internship at Zeiss Meditech, which is in the Bay Area. Uh, they design ophthalmic imaging equipment. So uh, those of you that wear glasses or have been to the eye doctor, uh, they put you in front of these machines. Um, and this is what Zeiss Meditech does, so really fascinating. Um, had the opportunity over about three months or so to work with the engineering team on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're basically a full-time employee during the internship. And this is probably the best experience I had. So in addition to the, the academic experience, you can really start to understand what industry is like at that time. So I'm finishing up my research. I'm working in an interdisciplinary group with Dr. Barton up at the hospital. It allows me to work with a lot of different types of people. And so I'm starting to think about what I want to do as a career. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Photonics West, but a big optics conference every January uh, held in the Bay Area. Uh, they do a lot in terms of career fairs and things like that. So uh, I think, guess it was the January, the year that I was graduating, I showed up with a bunch of resumes in hand, wanted to talk to companies. First company inside the door is Apple. And I'm like, well, I think I probably want to work for them. Um, the thing about a career fair, though, especially with Apple, is the line for Apple is always very long. Um, so there are a lot of other companies that are kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs. One of those was Microsoft. They're sitting in the corner. Um, <laughs> the HR rep is sitting over there. And I'm sure, just like myself, the other students are thinking, like, why do I want to go work for a software company? They're, they don't do optics. Uh, they have Xbox controllers that have little LEDs at the top of them. Um, I'm not sure if I want to spend 30 years designing LEDs. But on a whim, kind of went over there, gave him my resume. Uh, he started talking about things, and at the time, uh, the Xbox Connect was starting to become a, a big uh, product for them. So um, those of you that are familiar with Connect, we've since taken it out of our uh, repertoire, I guess. But uh, one of the first real products that utilized depth sensing to map the real world. So he started talking to me about this, and I was like, well, this is pretty exciting. You know, there's some pretty interesting applications out there. For, um, and I can understand how you might have some type of optical systems in the industry. But at the same time, I want to change the world. I want to do biomedical imaging. Um, so four months later, I had an interview with Microsoft um, and basically said, I'm going to go up here, but still not sure that I want to, in my mind, sell out. Because I'm not sure you're doing optics. I'm not sure you're doing the things that I want to do. I'm also about finished my, with my PhD. So I think I'm like the smartest person in the world at this point. So I know better than Microsoft, obviously. So um, go to this interview. And um, start talking to these amazing optical engineers that have had amazing careers in other industries. The first person I interview with is actually somebody that worked in the defense sector for about 30 years. He designed the head-mounted display that's currently flying in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. 
So it essentially what it is, it's a big helmet. It's a huge optical system is what it is. So he was the head architect for that. Um, the next interview I had was with the uh, lead designer of Connect, um, and he essentially imparted on me how neat Connect was. And so then I felt a little bit silly after that for thinking that you only do some form of optics. The other thing, though, essentially during this interview process um, is there's a lot of questions in the fundamentals of optics. So they're asking you about these things, and I'm sitting in there like, wow, I've actually taken courses on this stuff. I don't just have to make it up as I go in an interview, so it's kind of neat and exciting. Um, the other thing that was really interesting to me is that they talked about Connect, and they said that this is a really neat product. That we've never worked on anything like it before. And we can't tell you what we're working on next, but what I can say is if you consider the Connect to be a bicycle, we're working on a Ferrari. So, well, that takes a bit of a leap of faith. I could go work at Zeiss Meditech and image people's eyes, or I could do this thing that I have no idea what you guys are doing at the time. Um, so with that, I essentially took the leap of faith, and I jumped. And so with that, I joined Microsoft in uh, 2013, so about five years ago now. Um, and at this point, I still didn't know what they were doing, so I showed up day one. I said, hey, what are we doing? Are we doing Connect version 2? And they said, ah, uh, kind of. And then they showed me this video. And hopefully it'll work, otherwise that's an embarrassing transition. <laughs> Wait for it. There we go. Microsoft Holograms brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft Holograms, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with the people around you. Holograms and mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with visual content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. So I showed up, they showed me this video, and I said, well, that's pretty neat, but that's not real. You're not doing that. Day two, they showed me the demo, and it's real. Um, I was just telling Dr. Kim, I wish I would have brought a couple units. We could have done demos, but it's really, it's really a fascinating experience to put this on. And so what is Microsoft HoloLens? It's essentially a head-mounted display, an untethered device. It's a computer on your head, basically. We used to say an iPad on your head, but we thought that kind of sold it short. So we started changing our mind about how we described it a little bit. So um, why do they need optical engineers? So Microsoft is a software company. What are you doing? Well, this is actually a complete hardware product that's engineered inside and out by Microsoft. Um, specifically, in terms of some of the hardware, we can actually look at what's inside. The first thing you see when you take the visor off the front, which, by the way, is an optical component and requires optical level quality, you actually get to the sensor bar. Uh, if you look at your cell phone, you might have one, two cameras on it. We have nine. So um, we're good at over-engineering is another thing I should probably put out there. Um, but we have the depth camera, so you talk about kind of a version 2 connect is actually mounted right in the middle of the HoloLens. We have four um, essentially world tracking and hand tracking systems. We have a PV camera right in the middle. We have an ambient light, sister, s ambient light sensor. Um, so quite a few things, all optical systems that need to be individually designed on the component level before they can be integrated. Um, after this comes really what they call the crown jewel of the HoloLens, which is the display subsystem. Um, in terms of actually getting light into the user's eyes so that you can actually see through it and also put virtual objects on top of the real world, you have to design a system that's see-through, high resolution, and capable of doing so. So we have essentially this big block up here, not that big. You could actually kind of put it inside your fingers pretty easily. Uh, this is our essentially like a Pico projector type system or the light engine as we call it. And then we have to actually in-house design and fabricate these see-through holographic lenses, which anybody uh, who knows optics says those aren't holograms. And you're right. Uh, but we do use holograms to manufacture them. These are actually waveguide components using holographic elements on top of them. Um, since we're Microsoft, we're a computer company. We care about silicon, too. Um, not going to talk about it. Um, so also sound, not going to talk about it. So kind of jumping from this, so there's this big product. There's this amazing product. Uh, 
And so when you started a company, what is it like to work on something like this? Well, it's not just a product when you show up. You don't show up and they say, here's your camera module, design this. Actually, when you show up, there's actually something a little bit more primitive. Um, and so in this stage, when I showed up, we were kind of in between. And so there are different stages that you can think about working in when you look at an industry like this. Um, specifically, there are kind of product incubation teams that work on things. This then turns into a new product team. And then it ends up being what you would call a dev kit. HoloLens in the current form is still a dev kit, so you're still selling low volumes. You're still selling them for a lot of money. I know the idea is that uh, the big technology market makes a lot of money on hardware. Um, I guess I can tell you without quoting any numbers, we are not making much money on this. Probably zero, actually. Um, if you look at both sides of this, there are then research efforts that you can get into in terms of the big technology companies, and then you can also get more into the consumer market, so in terms of really high volumes, high quantities, things like that. So just to stress that at these big technology companies, there are a range of opportunities that you can jump into. And it's really important to, to think about what you might be interested in. So research is more academic, but in the uh, what I would call big tech budget. And then, of course, consumer into the uh, manufacturing and test. So just real quick to look back at kind of this list of companies, um, just a quick pop quiz. I know I have a couple minutes left here. Um, so what would you say just Apple as a company, what are they good at? What type of company are they? Any guesses? Mm -hmm. So computers, phones, good at that kind of stuff. What about Amazon? What's their company? Making money. That is true. <laughs> They're very good at making money. But e-commerce is kind of where they got started. Um, you get into Facebook. What are they? Social media. Yeah, so you can actually go down this list and say, OK, all these different companies are across the board. Um, I kind of tricked you guys a little bit, though, because this pop quiz I guess just gave you, all those answers are wrong. These are all optics companies. Um, and so you think about the different companies that are working on some of these various things. It's really important to note that everybody's working on everything right now. Um, not only is everybody working on TVs, computers, and gadgets, everybody's got smartphones, whether or not they're selling them or not. Everybody's interested in mixed reality. Uh, if you come to industrial affiliates, everybody's trying to build up their teams in this area. Um, everybody's doing Internet of Things right now as well. Christmas just came and went. How many people got Amazon Echoes? Like, pretty big deal. I don't know. Maybe it's not that exciting. Maybe you got the Apple one that looks like a roll of toilet paper, something like that. Um, but again, everybody's doing it. Sorry, dig there. Um, but then you start looking at some of the future tech as well. So smart sensing is becoming a really big thing, machine learning. Again, optics is required for all of this. Self-driving cars is a big thing. And again, all the companies are working on it. Why is Apple and Microsoft interested in self-driving cars? Because it's a big technology sector that's emerging, and there are things that can actually uh, play into this. Then you look at really down the road, what's essentially happened in terms of the infrastructure that's being put together? Um, artificial intelligence, cloud and quantum computing, again, everybody's working on this. Microsoft, for example, the GM of optics when I started, now heads the quantum computing division. So there are really a lot of opportunities at all of these different types of things and all of these different types of companies and across kind of the spectrum I showed of the different types of things. Um, just real quick, uh, in terms of the hiring and internships, how do you actually get involved in companies like this? Um, a question was asked to me uh, in terms of what type of people do we hire? And I actually asked Microsoft if we could release numbers and get you excited about the types of compensation packages and who we hire. They said, no, we hire everybody, um, whether it be a bachelor's degree to master's to PhD, we want, we want everybody to apply. Um, well, kind of behind the curtain a little bit, I can say that um, at least at industrial affiliates, we only talk to master's and PhD students. Um, we're not hiring that many people. We have a couple head count per year, so we can be very selective about this. I know that this is true of other companies as well. So just in terms of... Um, there are opportunities for bachelors, but there's much more opportunity for masters and PhD. So just to kind of get an idea about that. Um, just lastly, uh, I had a question last night about what I would recommend doing or what I would have done differently. Um, Love the internship that I did, but I was a bit late in the game in actually looking at getting one. Um, so just so everybody's aware, internships for the following summer, we usually hire in like the October to November time frame. And so the industrial affiliates at University of Arizona is a great opportunity. I know we do the same thing at Rochester and UCF as well. Um, what does an internship look like? Well, it's 12 weeks. You come in, you get paid full-time. It's the best. Um, not only are you a full-time employee, but you get to actually get free stuff, which is very exciting. Um, you get to go to these concerts. So all our full-time employees are very jealous of the interns. Um, but it really is a great opportunity to get your foot in the door uh, at various companies. All companies do internships. So um, just ask around. I would encourage you to do so. 
Um, again, it's a great opportunity to see what it's like to be part of industry. It's a great opportunity for these companies to um, work with you and see how you fit within the team. And so this is really a, a big thing that I would stress. So there's no yellow brick road. I apologize for that. Um, but at least the experience that I had that seemed to work well for me. Uh, one was have no idea what you want to do. Number two, go to graduate school. Number three, get an internship. And then number four, get into it. So a lot of information pretty quick there, but wanted to thank you all for having me again. Much appreciated. Good here. Some exciting things happening. Um, Great. Thank you for having me. I am excited to be here. My name is Jed Hancock. I love every opportunity that I get to come back to the University of Arizona. Um, my beautiful wife Natalie is here with me today. We made a nice little weekend, of, weekend out of this trip, and it was a pleasure being with you last night. And Last night, uh, down by the pool, we were hanging out with some of you guys, and that was really fun to get to know you a little bit more. Um, Natalie and I live in Logan, Utah, and I work at a place called Space Dynamics Lab. And what I'd like to share with you today is something that I took from the College of Optical Sciences, but not just in my career, but in here, you know, in, in my life, that has really helped me out, and it's called vision. So when I say the word vision, some of you might be thinking about ophthalmology or optometry, about how you see, but it's actually way different. This little image here shows you how when you get to an elevated position, and then you also apply some optics to it, you can actually see things you couldn't see before. And so the vision that I'm describing today in my talk is vision about leadership. Okay? It's got a few steps to it. Okay, last night there was only two of us from the West. Raise your hand if you've ever lifted a two-string bell of hay. Excellent. Raise your hand if you've ever milked a cow. Good. Raise your hand if you've ever poured concrete into a foundation building a house. Fantastic. This is how I grew up. My parents didn't go to school. I'm the first person, the only person in my family to have a degree in technology, let alone a PhD. It just wasn't part of, of the way I grew up. And when I went to college, to the engineering school, I sat down with the academic advisor and she looked at me and she said, Jed, I'm convinced electrical engineers are born and not made. You'll never make it. That's what she told me. So I got the chance to, to uh, prove her wrong every day for the next five years while I worked through my bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering. And it was an awesome experience. And you know what that experience was? Kind of what Thomas Edison said. It was an opportunity, but it was really work. When I was a kid, the bell wagon used to drop all those bells of hay outside the barn, and I'd have to hoist them in there with my brothers and my friends. And we'd stack those up until the barns got full by the end of the summer. And it was the same principle that happened to me in school. And at the University of Arizona, the hard work the work ethic, the character, all those things that I took from this school when I went here have gone with me to my, to my career. And so the first step of, of vision is actually having one, right? Setting goals and, and, and having that goal in front of you. So I congratulate all of you for being here. The second part is sharing the vision. Now, I worked at Space Dynamics Laboratory and an optical sciences alumni saw in me what I didn't know about me yet. I had done an internship at Micron Semiconductor, a technology company. In 2002, the CEO stood up and said, in a very future time, very near future, all cell phones will have a camera. And we all went, are you kidding me? Why would somebody want a camera on a cell phone? How would you have the bandwidth to send a picture anywhere? That was in 2002. 
Boy, he was right. By 2005, you could not buy even a flip phone hardly without a camera. And I got the love of optics working on cell phones at Micron Semiconductor in Boise, Idaho. And I started to share that vision that I loved optics. Blake, who I worked with, saw that in me. I came here, and pretty soon I had friends that I studied with from talking to Masood last night from really all across the world, close friends from, from countries from, from far and near, professors that you can see in the back row. You share your vision of what you want to become with these professors, they will help you get there. Very integral part. And then, of course, you have your family, your other close associates. If you have a vision, you must share it, okay? Um, Third step of vision, you need to agree on the outcome. Okay, did you see that uh, Dean Koch, he showed some statistics of students, the number of certificates, the number of masters, the number of PhDs. I'm a statistic in three of those boxes. When I started, I said, I'll do a certificate in optics. That was my agreed outcome. I got to it. What did I do? I moved that finish line. I kept going one course. I got a master's degree. Something in here just wouldn't let me quit, right? The agreed upon outcome in my heart was to complete a PhD. And uh, that was something that was established over time. But as you have vision, you'll be working with large teams. Andrew just gave an awesome talk about technology. Hundreds of people are agreeing upon the outcome of that product to make it a reality. Um, so, you know, perhaps when you, when you establish an outcome, most things you can measure. Okay, my agreed outcome was graduation. And I could measure that. But I think the most important thing I took from the College of Optical Sciences was things that I couldn't measure. Changes that were happening to me in here. As I became not only just aware of the technology, but the people in this industry, the vast amounts of opportunity that there, that there were, and the work ethic that I saw, and the tenacity to become something that I didn't know I could become. All right, step four. <laughs> James Clerk Maxwell did not come up with these beautiful, elegant equations in one day, did he, Masood? Not a day, okay? You have to break it down. So when I was 21, the same age as some of the guys I was talking to last night, some of these, some of these I call them kids, young people, um, I told my dad, I said, Dad, if I do engineering like this or, or optical sciences, I'll, I'm going to be like in my late 20s when I finish, you know, 26 when I finish a master's degree and maybe 30 when I finish my PhD. And he said, well, you can be 26 and have a master's degree or 26 and not have one. And so I, had to, I, had, I couldn't look at that all at once. I had to break that down. And so it's really one homework assignment at a time, one exam at a time. One stage of your life at a time. When you have vision and you're going after a large goal, you have to break that down. And one thing that I realized in College of Optical Sciences is that long days are what create short years. I look back at my experience here with incredible fondness, me and my family. And those long days and that intense studying really constituted some short years that were, were, were just awesome. All right. What's the next step of anybody who's using leadership to create a vision is to motivate and inspire. I think you've felt that on your trip here so far. Um, you're going to feel that in the additional labs that you see, the, the people you interact with, the professors at the College of Optical Sciences, they have this down. Uh, motivate and inspire. And they, and they will do that as you study with them, as you do homework, you prepare for exams. Um, I took several, a lot of my courses distance, and these professors, they'd got on Skype with me. They talked to me on the phone. And when you have a vision, you need to motivate and inspire others. Um, so it's kind of a trick to keep the carrot close enough that you know that you can achieve this. And uh, one of the things that I think really motivated and inspired me was what Andrew talked about. It was working on internships, getting that sense for what, it, what really I was involved with and what I really could become and where I could work. And if you come to Optical Sciences, um, we don't build two of anything. I work at Space Dynamics Lab, and we, are, we do research and development. We build one of everything. Technology companies, the more they sell, the better. You can do anything in between in optics. Um, the field is so wide. 
Okay, one of the funnest parts of having vision is reporting back. The day I passed my preliminary examinations. Okay, we had the written comprehensive exams. If you passed that, you went on to your oral comprehensive exam. I went to the pool with my little kids. I took my wallet out, my phone, took off my shoes, and I jumped in. I told them I had about five minutes for a midlife crisis and we should enjoy it together. <laughs> and so this is an opportunity to report back. Share what you're experiencing in your vision with those that are closest to you. Report the outcomes. And it makes that experience really special. Um, you know, a lot of people will commit to do something. But until you get to this last stage of vision, having the opportunity to report back on what you've accomplished, you miss the magic that happens inside. And so these five steps of vision, okay, I've taken this through my whole career. Uh, when I started in my career, I was the one aligning the laser system to the LIDAR. I was the one writing the MATLAB code for their radiometric analysis. I was the one deciding if we could see those intercontinental ballistic missiles or not. Um, and I still do a little bit of that, but because of, of vision, a lot of people know how to do things, but it, the special leaders of organizations know what to do next. And as you come here to the College of Optical Sciences, you'll not only learn how to do things, you'll not only gain subject matter expertise, but you'll gain the vision of what needs to be done next to lead large groups of people in directions they need to go. Um, so I can, I can truly point to my experiences in my career, with my family, other aspects of my life, and I can draw a lot of roads that all cross down here in Tucson. And the definition of success, it's a pretty simple equation, preparation and opportunity. While you're here, you'll be preparing. You'll be gaining that character and work, ec work ethic, study habits, subject matter expertise, all those things. Your tool belt will be full of tools. And also, because you've come here, you'll be flush with opportunity. Now, a lot of people will try to tell you something. They will try to say, oh, it doesn't matter what your grades are. It doesn't matter what you choose to do in school. It doesn't matter what school you go to. They're all completely wrong. Everything matters. Um, when I was at my internship in Micron Semiconductor, I learned a technique called photon transfer analysis that I have since used on those detectors that went into the OSIRIS-REx mission, detectors that have gone on, going on the ICON mission, and over and over again. 20 years I've been using this technique that I learned when I was 21. The opportunities, uh, they'll just come. I, ca I can't explain to you, Christian, other, other alumni that I associate with, I have an intern from the College of Optics that works with me, has been with me for two summers. So people coming now, alumni way ahead of me, people that I went to school with are still great friends and great associations, and those opportunities just never cease. Okay, so I work at Space Dynamics Lab. And we're owned by Utah State University. We have about 600 employees. Our uh, growth rate's been about 15% the last few years. We have about 30 openings right now. We have an internship program. Of those 600 people, 120 approximately are students. They work right alongside us with our projects. We have four divisions, the Civil Space Division. I'm the director of Civil Space. That's all the projects we do for NASA and commercial companies. Strategic Military Space testing and calibration, and then C4 ISR, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance. One of the first projects I got to work on was an infrared telescope. Like I mentioned, we build a, one of everything. Okay? This telescope is a 40 centimeter gold-coated mirror, as you can see it inside there, that's sitting inside what we call a cryostat that is packed with solid hydrogen. That telescope in space operates at 8 Kelvin, okay? 8 degrees above absolute zero. And when WISE was launched, as you look up in the sky with your eyes, that's what you see, but this is the images that WISE returned in the infrared, a spectrum that our eyes can't see. Why look at the sky in the infrared? Well, we can see stars that have yet to form. We can see nebula, ionized gases that are as expansive as our Milky Way galaxy. And Tycho Supernova, you can look that up online, burned in 1572, we can still see that in the infrared. So you're really peeling back time, seeing ahead, seeing, seeing before you, and seeing now in the infrared. So this is what we had of the infrared universe in 1983. 
WISE was launched in 2010, and this is what it gave us. Those are the kind of instruments that we build at Space Dynamics Lab, and that's the kind of things our, our optical instruments, our optical scientists work on. Now, Christian showed an awesome movie. Did you see that with all the asteroid discoveries? Somebody sitting by me went, wow, in 2010, you saw all the white wings on the side? Did you see that? That was the WISE instrument. One of the things that we found out with WISE is that asteroids, which are dark, they actually glow in the infrared. They absorb that heat from the sun and they re-emit. They're 300 Kelvin black bodies or so. There's 100 asteroids in this frame. They're wherever these moving dots are. And if you train your eye, you'll see them everywhere. Everywhere we looked in the night sky with WISE, we saw asteroids. So yes, Arizona, the Catalina Sky Server, over time, they are the most productive asteroid surveys. But in the year that WISE was going, it found over half the asteroids that were discovered that year. Such great power in the infrared to find the asteroids. Now, we know about 15,000 Earth objects. If we get to do the next mission that we're calling NEOCAM, it's kind of a next WISE mission designed specifically to find asteroids, we'll discover 300,000 of them that are currently unknown. That's what our statistics tell us. Christian mentioned how the vast majority of the asteroids are out in the main belt, trapped between the gravitational pull of Jupiter and the rest of the solar system. Well, we know of about 700,000 of them. I think he cited 685,000 or something. Guess, yes, guess how many we'll find if we launch NEOCAM? About 8 million. Okay. These are all planetary bodies in our solar system, remnants that were left over from the solar system formation that contain clues about why our solar system looks the way it does. My time's about up. It's not every day at work that you get to have a $120 million payload hanging from a chain. This is an instrument suite we call ICON, Ionospheric Connection Explorer. It's right now being prepared for launch off a Pegasus rocket from Kwajalein, a tiny little atoll or little island out in the Pacific. This has six unique optical instruments on it. We developed the cameras and optical systems for, for, for about three of those instruments at SDL. We did all the integration, thermal vacuum, all those things. And uh, that's our team getting this ready. The other thing I mentioned we do is we provide for the national defense. We help make our country safe, secure, and uh, take a lot of national pride in the work we do. But I think perhaps the greatest product from the College of Optical Sciences, from where I work at Space Dynamics Lab, it's you. The greatest product is that we know, I know, I know that my colleagues at the University of Arizona know that when you have great education, great experiences, and a great career, your life gets better. Your life is better. It's more enriched. You're happier. And uh, perhaps the greatest motivation for me is not just all of these things, but it's the family that I live with, those that I love and uh, hold dear and sharing that vision with those around me. And that's, that's what College of Optical Science has given me in terms of vision. Thank you.